Okay. Uh, well, great. So after uh, a great talk by Friedman, I guess we'll uh, we go back to methodology, right? The, the workshop of methodology. So I'm not, not going to talk about my research, right? I'm going to talk about methodology, right? Specifically. So don't be disappointed, right? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the EEG, okay? Partly because uh, we looked at the projects, the Mercury projects, and it looks like there are a number of projects that actually propose EEG as one of the main methods to use, okay? Actually, how many of you, uh, if I can ask you, can you raise your hand if in your project there is an EEG component? People are here. All right, good. So there's a bit of an you know, inflation of EEG method, that's good. And uh, so I think it's a good time to um, say a few things about EEG. We're going to have uh, actually um, project, something like a an EEG bootcamp in the fall, okay? Like one day where we're gonna do lots of hands-on and uh, some theory as well, okay? So wait for that. Get some of those wireless systems. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we're gonna try different systems, right? Collect some data, analyze it, and you know, ask questions, <coughs> try to brainstorm and all that, okay? So today's gonna be just a very kind of um, quick overview of things. I just picked a few topics, and uh, uh, forgive me if I don't if I didn't be press the topic you wanted to have specifically, okay? So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the neural basis of EEG. What is EEG recording, really? What is it doing? Something about how to record the EEG, a few things about equipment, and then a uh, few things about ERPs specifically, because it is still the most used methodology, right? Something about oscillations, right? That's also a very important topic. And finally, I want to spend a little time on uh, what is referred to as source localization. Okay? So we got ERPs, we want to see actually where they're coming from, the generators. And there are lots of misunderstandings actually about this topic, about how difficult it is and what you can get out of it. Okay? Alright, so as you know, basically, continuous science has a mission. The mission is basically to bring together at least these three areas. Information from behavior, computation of the brain, and Friedman's talk actually gave us a very good example of, of, um, of how to do this a little bit, okay? So he has data from both behavior, computation of the brain. And when we do that, obviously, an important question is, okay, how do we collect data about the brain, okay? We are dealing mostly with normal, healthy adults, most of us, okay? And so what techniques are there, okay? So you all know that there are a few techniques, not many, right? And I'm going to specifically focus on this technique today, okay? Now, you've probably seen this figure a few times before in the past. This figure basically shows um, uh, many of the cognitive neuroscience techniques rated along two axes, okay? We've got one axis here, the x-axis has to do with the temporal resolution, okay? How well can you resolve things in time using that technique, okay? And if you notice, the scale is in, in uh, uh, log 10, forward, okay, which means that if, if there is a zero, it means 10 to the zero, one second, one means 10 seconds, one of the seconds, and so on, okay. So basically, if you look at these techniques, you can see that you go all the way from uh, milliseconds, 10 to the minus 3, right, all the way to uh, days and years when you're, look, when you're using uh, techniques that have to do, for example, with brain damage, okay, it takes months, right. So as you can see, uh, as you go up here, this is where the um, EEG is, right? It's around here. So you're measuring neural phenomena at the millisecond level, okay? That's the thing to keep in mind, which is actually very important because that's really at the time scale at which many quantity processes happen, okay? And if you look carefully down here, you see that there are only many other techniques that can be used actually with this kind of temporal resolution, right? You've got TMS, which is really not an, an imaging technique, although it can be used in some cases as an imaging technique, okay? Uh, but basically, we only have other techniques that can, that can only be used in animals or in uh, patients, only in very extreme cases, okay? So basically, EG and EG are essentially the only techniques that allow us to record data at this kind of temporal resolution in um, healthy individuals, all right? On the y-axis here, we have instead uh, the space dimension, okay? Again, log scale, so again, uh, in millimeter, so uh, zero means millimeter scale, one means uh, centimeter, two means 10 centimeters, and so on, okay? 
And as you can see, the GMG is kind of uh, ambiguously located in this range here. So you can't tell if it is one centimeter or 10 centimeters or what, right? But there is a reason for that, I think. And the reason is that when we talk about localization of ERP and EG sources, the meaning of that word actually can be quite ambiguous, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? But just remember that if you have a specific spatial location in a question in mind, okay, so where are things coming from, EEG and ERP is, uh, is just not the right technique for that, okay? So you should basically um, use something else, at least in combination with, uh, with EEG, all right? You want to address that question. Okay, so uh, briefly, what, what those uh, EEG means just uh, is basically a graphic representation of uh, the difference in voltage between two different brain locations plotted over time, okay? That's what the word means. And uh, this is like a standard time series that you can get when you look at a random EEG plot, okay? It looks like a running motion thing with some regularity in it, okay? And uh, very generally, uh, the EEG measures essentially the activity of large populations of, of neurons. There are two types. One is the one you can report from the scalp, which is the one we're going to be doing over the next few years, okay? And you can do essentially lots of experiments, it doesn't cost a lot, and you can do both research and also investigate clinical questions if you want, right? Then there is the other one, which is actually uh, really cool and very important, but uh, we're not going to do that because you can only do that at uh, very few centers in the world that specialize in, in doing this kind of work, okay? And basically, in this case, you have uh, you do work in uh, uh, people with epileptic uh, uh, problems, okay? So they have uh, seizures, essentially, and they tried medications of all sorts that didn't work. And so as a last resort, you basically try to record from the brain directly by inserting wires and electrodes inside the brains, okay? So it's very basic, but you can get really high-resolution information that can be very helpful. Okay, just a couple of things about history. Uh, perhaps some of you already know that uh, it was discovered by Hans Berger in the mid-twenties, okay? And uh, he basically was able to, uh, to document alpha rhythms from the occipital cortex, and the reason is that these guys are really huge, okay? So even with the rather crude equipment he had at the time, he was able to see it, okay? And one important thing that I want to mention, actually, is that this phenomenon was only recognized, actually, two, uh, 10 years later. Okay? So for many years, Berger was actually ridiculed. People said, no, no, you're, you're looking at crap, okay? It's not real, okay? And I think there is a bit of a general lesson here about, uh, uh, about false negatives, okay? You probably heard a lot about of people over the last few days about <coughs> false positives, okay? People are a bit obsessed in these days about uh, being sure not getting a false positive, right? And all this stuff about statistics and inflation and that, you know? But I think it's equally, if not more important, to make sure that you don't get false negatives, which means that you don't ignore stuff that is real, okay? Like happened for 10 years in, in this case, okay? All right, that's basically just uh, in the old days, you were using paper to record actually the, uh, the EEG and all that, right? And one other point I want to make is that you typically always record something relative to something else, okay? So usually people use some reference electrodes that can be in various parts of the head, like the ear or the nose and so on, okay? This is like a plot you can get if you uh, record some EEG data, okay? Nowadays, we actually get many more channels than these. We get 64, 100, and so on, right? We got time here, seconds, and these are different channels, okay? So you can see lots of uh, little phenomena here, which I'm gonna mention some of them later on. These are blinks, for example, these are alpha waves, and uh, basically, generally, some kind of semi-oscillatory stuff going on throughout, okay? This is from a normal individual. This one actually is from an individual who's uh, um, was some uh, problems essentially, and around around this time here, you can see that there are these uh, uh, huge oscillations. The scale here is 200 microvolts. Okay, so these guys are about uh, 400 microvolts. Very low frequency. You got about one hertz or two hertz. Okay, this is very unusual in um, some uh, normal adult, awake normal adult. Okay, and at this point, basically, this person will become unresponsive, okay? So the hyperventilating, he was going through some seizure phenomena, okay? Perfect. So just to give an idea of how things look like. Okay, a couple of things to go 
know the general basis of EEG, okay? what those EEG measure, really. We know that there is some, something electrical in the brain, okay? but what is it? I think that. You'd be surprised to, to actually know that there hasn't been a lot of research to try to really pin down this question, right, in detail, okay? So these are all basically similar speculations based on circumstantial evidence, but that's the best we have, okay? So, the basic idea is that we've got lots of neurons in the brain, of course, and these are very tiny, they generate very tiny electrical fields, right? Each one of these neurons generates electrical fields that are too small to be seen, obviously, from the scalp. So they have to somehow be combined over time and space to be able to be seen. And as you know, there are two types of electrical activity in neurons that, are, um, that we know about. The first one is action potentials, probably you all know about those, right? So the question is, are we seeing actual potentials at the scalp? Okay? If you remember, like, an actual potential is something that happens very quickly. It lasts about one milliseconds, huge amplitude, about 100 millivolts, actually. Right? And uh, basically, uh, we got this signal that goes from the body of the, of the neurons all the way to the axon. Okay? Now, the problem with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, actual potentials in terms, in terms of seeing them at the scalp is that they are too quick, okay? They happen within one millisecond, okay? And it is very likely that different neurons are going to fire within that same window, okay? So you're going to get you know, lots of neurons firing, but not in sync. And so they don't sum up. And so you never get this kind of response that you can see this scale, okay? So basically, uh, we don't see actual potential in this scale, okay? The other source of electrical activity relay is uh, so we call postsynaptic potentials, as you know if you've uh, studied the Lubinto things, right? And that's the way it works. Basically, you've got an action potential coming down here. It's an axon, right? They connect to the, to the postsynaptic neuron, right? You have a release of some a neurotransmitter here that essentially uh, acts on the, on the, on, on the postsynaptic neuron. And it generates these so called EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or inhibitory. There are two types, okay? Depending on the neurotransmitter and other things, right? But the main thing to remember is that these EPSPs and ITSPs actually last much longer than the actual potential. Okay? So they last up to basically 50, 100 milliseconds. And during that time, actually, there is, there is uh, enough time for different neurons to, for, to basically act in concert so you can get basically the sum of all these neurons doing this bit. Okay? So that's basically what we are seeing in the EG. We're seeing basically uh, a combination of many EPSPs across many different neurons. And these neurons here, these are pyramidal cells, okay? This is the cortex, you can see, right? These neurons are all aligned uh, together, parallel together, and therefore these little electric dipoles can sum up if they happen basically within this 100 millisecond time period, okay? So that's pretty much what we are seeing uh, here, the scalp. Okay? Here's just a little example to see what happens when different neurons uh, basically are um, produce EPSPs at different times. You can see that nothing happens here because they, uh, they don't sum up. All right? They happen at different times. But when they're kind of synchronized within the 100 millisecond window, they actually start summing up spatially and you get to see something in the EEG. Okay? This is just an actual um, picture of how things look like, okay? This one is actually 100 microns, okay, the scale, so it's very tiny, okay? And uh, again, what we see in the scalp here, up here, is uh, basically EPSP is happening in uh, thousand and thousand of neurons that essentially uh, are active at the same time, more or less, okay? And this one, you don't need to remember this, but basically depending on, uh, on where the axons uh, end up on the dendrites of these neurons, you can get both uh, a positive field up or a negative field up, okay? So you don't remember this, there are just you know, a number of, of, uh, of slight complications. Okay, great, so that's basically the, the main idea about the EG, where it's coming from, okay? That's what we are recording, not actual potential, but EPSPs IPSPs essentially, the combination. Alright, so how do we actually record the EG? You've probably seen um, some videos on YouTube or something, or perhaps you've seen some lives where this happens, but just to remind you a little bit, right? We have to obviously use electrodes, okay, to uh, record or 
pain in different parts of the hand. And uh, uh, usually people use a standard uh, location system called the 1020 system like this one. These are just a few electrons, but you can have many, many more. And typically we use um, essentially uh, many electrons with many different types of cap configurations. Some of these you've seen perhaps uh, before, right? Some um, caps have electrons that are attached to the, to the cap. Some of them you actually insert them into the cap and there are all sorts of combinations. Okay? And of course, when you uh, record EG, you also put some electrons on the face because, as we see in a second, we, uh, we have to also measure uh, our movement essentially. That's what these electrodes are for. Okay, as I said, there are uh, many different types of, of montages, right? For example, with 32 electrodes, you can have a 1020 system like this where you start inserting electrodes in between, right? You got 64, you can go up to 256, right? But for uh, most experiments, you see that 64 electrodes actually is, is plenty, both in terms of how long it takes to actually set it up, and also in terms of the kind of data that you get, okay? So again, if people always ask, you know, how many electrons should I use for my experiment? And like almost for everything, it depends on your question, right? It's, uh, you know, you want to use as many as you can, but obviously not too many that becomes counterproductive, okay? It takes obviously longer in most cases to set up um, more electrons, okay? Even though some systems actually are pretty quick, quick to, uh, to set up, right? Depends on your effects, the effects you're looking for, right? Some effects are very broad, like the P300, for example, if you're looking for that, it's very broad, so you don't need 100 electrons to actually measure that, right? Some more focal. And uh, um, generally, up to a certain number, perhaps uh, 64, 128, actually, the more you have and the better you uh, can achieve some localization when you do the localization of, of the EG, okay? For uh, many uh, systems, with passive electrodes or, or what they call wet electrodes, even active electrodes, right? You have to use a conductive gel paste to basically connect up the, the electrode to the skin, okay? For example, this one. There are nowadays some new systems based on the called tri electrodes that don't require this type, okay? And uh, we'll talk about that perhaps even uh, during the workshop next time in, in the fall, because the data is not as good as with these other systems, okay? And also a couple, about, uh, a couple of words about EG amplifiers, okay? Now, to give you an idea of how big the signals are, okay? We got the 9 volt battery and a 1.5 volt micro battery here. This is our standard EG time series, right? And the size of this guy is really on the order of a few tens of microvolts, okay? So these are millions, millions of volts, okay? So they're really tiny. And therefore, we're not going to be able to measure them with a, with a multimeter like this one. Yeah? <coughs> we need to have specialized equipment, specialized amplifiers to boost the signals. Okay? Now, in the old days, we had these gigantic, massive uh, systems, okay? which actually were weighed like almost a ton. It was like an entire wall, right? These were, were made by, uh, for example, a, a company called Grass. They're still making uh, biomedical equipment, right? Each one of these little boxes was actually a single amplifier. It was actually very long, right? And you could control, for example, the gain of the amplifier, the cutoff frequencies, and, and all that, okay? These actually were high-quality um, systems, okay? So you were getting actually pretty good data, right? Nowadays, is that we have uh, systems such as this one. This is not in real scale, uh, in which most of the, most of the uh, EG system really is this integrated circuit, right? which is about one centimeter by one centimeter, right? It's actually this guy made by Texas Instruments, is the ATS-1299, okay? Which is used by the OpenBCI project, okay? So this IC actually has all the components of what was one of those old gigantic systems, okay? So this single guy here has basically eight channels of EG, including the um, AD converter, okay? So you use this guy, use a few other components and you've got your uh, EEG system basically, okay? And again, uh, there is a con there is a, this uh, organization called OpenBCI, I don't know if you've seen that before, uh, used to be funded by DARPA, but they're actually trying to, uh, to mass produce these kind of systems uh, because they want people to start using basically EEG in, uh, in their daily life basically, okay? Do all sorts of things, okay? 
and you can actually have uh, even a daisy chain plan so you can have systems with A16 and so on. Okay? It's, it's a really cool system and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get our hands on some of these uh, as soon as they are ready. Okay? They're still actually producing. Okay. Also, uh, perhaps some of you have seen in, uh, in the media things like these, emotive, they have this kind of uh, wireless um, devices, okay, which you can just put in your head like that, and if you look at the ads, they are supposed to allow you to control a video game, okay, like, you know, a real tournament or something, okay, in reality, they don't do that, probably they're totally hyped, but I think you can still get something out of this if you want to do some um, some research, uh, you can do, um, you can get some basically low quality signals, but you can still do some kind of VCI type of research if you want to do that, okay, so I was trying to actually get at least one of these guys here, just to play with it to see you know, how far you can go with that. Okay? But again, don't believe the hype when they tell you now you can control things in your mind. You can't, alright? It's just a uh, system. Okay, any questions so far? Sorry, feel free to interrupt me at any time. It's mostly methodology again, so there's not much controversial stuff. Right? Okay. We've got two electrons, right? You've got to, it is something to collect the data from, right? Uh, these are like the traditional um, electrons that you can put on the head. And uh, you can have um, different metals for the electrons, okay? You can go from very cheap electrons made of tin, all the way to the expensive ones made of uh, basically gold, gold plated, okay? And uh, these ones are more expensive, obviously, but they also get better signals because essentially uh, at the interface between the metal and the skin, you get some kind of a battery effect, okay? like a little battery, and you can get this slow drift if you're not careful. So it's good to get um, these guys if you can, right? These are the passive electrodes, okay? You put gel in there, and then you record. Nowadays we have um, lots of systems that have actually active electrodes, such as this one from Biosemi, okay? So this guy here has, uh, inside, there is a little uh, integrated circuit that acts as a preamp, all right? Right at the electrode allocation, and then you collect data as usual. And perhaps last time, some of you also saw the, the, the tri electron system. I don't know if you, if you were there when uh, it was demonstrated, right? That showed this little thing with little spots, okay? So there are some tri electrons as well that do not require any, any gel of conductor Okay. Okay, again, so what system to use? Again, right? Uh, that depends also on your question, okay? So if you want to study basically. Um, driver, right? Driving on the street and in real life, so of course you're going to have to use a system that uh, is a mobile system, okay? You have to be able to put it in the car and all that, right? But if you're interested in, uh, in something more, more, more basic, basic science, like, you know, studying basically the effect of affordances or language, whatever, right? What you can do in the lab, then you don't need to have a mobile system, okay? And uh, in general, actually, when you have basically a wireless one of these systems, actually, your data is not as typically as good, okay, as what you can do in the lab with a standard system, okay. So again, just remember that some, just because something is new and cool and trying to mean that you get good data, okay, you have to always think about what you're trying to get, out of, okay. Okay, uh, just a couple of things about ERPs, okay, because that's um, again it's the main. Um, the main way of collecting um, data, essentially, even these days, okay? And some of the stuff you already know, probably, right? And uh, so I show you basically these recordings stretching over tens of seconds. Most of the times, unless we do that for clinical purposes, right, we don't care about this, all these 10 seconds, okay? We care about seeing what happens in the brain when we do something to the subject, okay? For example, we can show them a word, we can show them as an object, or have them respond, and so on, okay? So basically, we want to uh, essentially time block these signals to some event that interests us, okay? So for example, we got a um, trial here, running an experiment where we show essentially a blank screen, a cross, a fixation cross, and then a word, for example, could be anything, okay? Pretty boring experiment, but that's you know, one example. And then there's a response, okay? So what we do, we assign events to all of these uh, little items, okay, including the response, 101, 102, right? And by assigning the events, we can later actually, uh, event codes, we can later actually uh, time block the AG to these event codes, okay? So for example, we have a standard AG trace here, 
But in addition to that, we also have these event codes that allow us essentially to time lock things to these times. Okay? And that's the difference between the EG and the year period. We have these additional pieces here. Again, right, remember that if you look at the EG, it looks pretty noisy. It's this kind of um, semi amorphous uh, time series, okay? And so, representing the world here, but if you look here, you know, you can't see anything happening, really, it's just stuff, okay? And so basically, to be able to, uh, to uh, figure, some, figure out what's going on here, you have to use some, uh, some methods, and one of them really is uh, averaging. So you've got to average different trials, that's one of the methods, okay? And that's how you actually develop the year bit. Okay, so I think averaging is one way you have to do it, right? You have to average several, several, several kinds of trials, typically. And also, you basically have to, uh, to start with clean data to begin with, okay? So if you start with lots of um, crap in your data, it's going to be very difficult to get good data, okay? So I will spend one couple of slides on these artifacts, okay? Just to tell you that they exist, okay? I can spend you know, an hour talking about this, but... So in this case, you've got your uh, standard EEG going on here, and you see this gigantic deflection here, which actually are due to um, are artifacts, due to blades, okay? Basically, the eye, the eye is like a little battery, okay? So as you move it around, when you blink, or as you move your eyes around, you actually generate this big changes in the field that you can measure the skull, okay? Especially the front of, the front of the head. And before you average this stuff, you have to um, find a way of removing or, 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 or um, deleting this kind of kind of artifacts, okay? Now, there are many types of artifacts, which I'm not going to discuss today. This one is due to muscle tension. This one is due to, you can see, uh, even uh, um, heart artifacts in, uh, on, on the head, half a weight and all that. So all these are artifacts that you should uh, try to remove, basically, before you do your average of, of the EG, right? And you can do two things. You can either remove them, right? So you just chop this piece and you don't have it, right? Or you can also try to, uh, to correct them, okay? So there are some methods to do that. Perhaps the most common one these days is called the independent component analysis, right? ICA, you may have heard of that before. And uh, again, I can probably spend an hour talking about this method, right? But just to give you an idea, there is uh, a mathematical way of getting um, an EEG recording here, right? Space and time. And decomposing it into a bunch of statistically independent components, okay? These are like time series. And you can basically, um, these are statistically independent, this guy, this guy, this guy, okay? And you can see basically the scalp distribution of each one of these components. Now, it turns out that uh, many times, when you look at these components, you find that they actually um, capture specific artifacts in the data, okay? So you've got this one, this one, they seem to capture actually um, the blinks, okay? That's why you get this frontal distribution, okay? And you've got this one, this one, this one, they seem to capture actually some uh, um, EMG, muscle artifacts, okay? This one perhaps is capturing some um, horizontal eye movements, which has this typical square wave kind of thing, right? So what you can do, you can uh, essentially zero these components, okay? And then you reconstruct the EG, okay? And that's what you get, the EG without these artifacts, okay? That's the theory, right? In practice, you're never entirely sure that this guy is not cap capturing also some of the stuff you want, right? But you can do some, uh, basically, test with, you know, half the trials and see if, if it looks, looks the same or not, okay? So I think it's a good method if, you, um, if you're running short of trials and you, you can't afford to really get rid of all the data, okay, that was affected. So it's a good thing to try. And ACA actually, it can be used for many other things that are uh, quite interesting, also theoretical, not just for removing artifacts. Okay? All right, so once you've uh, removed your artifacts, you've got a bunch of epochs, right, that you can uh, average. So these are repetitions of, of, uh, of, uh, of the same event, so you put the board dog, put the other boards, right, and you uh, average them together, time log to the zero point here, okay? So one thing to remember is that the signal to noise, right? The signal is basically what you're interested in, okay? Which is a bit difficult to, to define, right? But basically it's what is evoked, for example, by the wall that you're presenting, okay? And noise is everything else you look at, okay? 
and this delivery, right? But typically with EEG, the signal noise is actually pretty pretty poor, okay? It's very poor, that's why you have to do average, right? And what we have actually estimated the noise really is to um, is to look at what happens, look at how much stuff there is before the zero time. Okay? So before you present the stimulus, there's gonna be activity, and you can measure that, calculate the power of that, and that's what we have estimated the noise. Okay? As a rule of thumb, under uh, some assumptions that I'm not going to discuss, right? Essentially, if you quadruple the number of trials, you, you increase your um, signal to noise ratio only by two, okay? So the square root, okay? So you have to do lots of trials to just increase the signal to noise, okay? This is a simple example. We've got two trials, and uh, this is one present the stimulus. And uh, again, this is uh, what happens on different trials. Okay, when we present, for example, a word. And this is what happens when we uh, average one trial, two trials, two trials, and so on, all the way to eight. What you can see, there are two things that you can see, uh, which are pretty obvious, is that the pre-zero stuff tends to cancel out, okay, becomes smaller and smaller. That's why people refer to it as noise, okay? Although, of course, you can have some stuff here that is uh, due to, for example, expectation of the stimulus. So, you know, okay, there are some, lots of things to discuss there. Whereas, uh, the post-stimulus stuff, like this uh, pitring and the like thing, it's bigger than bigger, okay? That's the idea, all right? So, in the end, you get something like this. It's obviously um, highly, um, it's a schematic, schematic of what you get. You get, essentially, some pretty smooth, potential at the end with uh, various peaks and valleys. That's the traditional way of looking at it. And you can give names, okay? Like P1, positivity, posit first positivity, and one, first negativity, and so on, okay? That's, as I said, is the traditional way of doing things. And if you read most of the papers, you'll still see this kind of um, classification, basically, okay? It doesn't mean it's wrong, it's just that's the way people have been doing it for many years, okay? And I'm not gonna go into this, but there are lots of components that have been studied to death, almost, right? And so uh, C1, P1, and one and all that. We have, uh, these are visual components, these are auditory components. You got also the components for high level cognition stuff, okay? So perhaps if you do some of your experiments, you'll uh, be studying some of these components. So you'll, or you, or you'll see them in your own data, okay? But again, today it's about methodology. I'm not going to talk about what these components are about, okay? Or whether you know they're, they're real or what or that. Okay, I just want to point out a couple of things about averaging. There are some assumptions, obviously. There are actually some pretty strong assumptions. First of that, of this assumption is that all sources of voltage are random with respect to the time block in event, except to the EOP, okay? Now that's a big assumption because you can have all sorts of uh, artifacts that are time blocked as well, and if that's the case, then they're gonna show up in your average, okay? And the second thing is that the amplitude and the timing of the ERP signal is the same on each trial, okay? That's an obvious assumption of averaging, that you're basically getting something plus random not on each trial, okay? And again, this one is really, uh, oh, it's also basically a big assumption, okay? Because in practice, uh, you may have like single trials like this in green. You can have a lot of uh, latency jitter, for example, single trials, okay? And if you do the averaging, you're going to get basically some smearing if there's a lot of latency jitter, for example, in different trials. So you can have, for example, an F400 that onsets different times in different trials. If you average them, you're going to get a smooshed up N400, okay? So basically, uh, there's always this issue of whether um, if you get a smaller component, is it due because the component is really smaller, or is it because there is more latency jitter in the single trials, okay? And there are things you can do to really look into this, okay? Like you do some single trial analysis, stuff like that, okay? But I'm not gonna go into that today. So anyway, just keep in mind that probably if you do uh, an EMP study, you'll be doing some averaging like this one, but these are all things to keep in mind, okay? As potential uh, objections to the result in the end, okay? All right, so I talked about averaging. And uh, now I'm going to say a few things about oscillations because that's the, uh, the other side of the coin. Okay? Now, basically, uh, as you were able to see also in the traces I showed you, you were able to see lots of kind of oscillatory things, okay? Here and there, right? And uh, 
this phenomena really are not phase locked to certain events. They just happen, okay, during certain mental states, okay? And this makes sense because the brain has lots of feedback loops, okay? So when every time you have feedback, loop, feedback loops, you have delays and you have oscillations, okay? That's basically uh, why we have these oscillations in part. Some of them, you can see them on the line. So if I measure UEG now, even if I don't show you anything, you do not think you're going to see some beta, typically, if you're just awake, okay? And uh, but there are many other rhythms that occur all the time, essentially, okay? But there are also some oscillations that are actually induced by uh, certain stimuli, okay? So you've got basically ongoing oscillations and also some um, stimulus-induced oscillations. And that's the one I want to uh, briefly talk about because it relates to the issue of energy, okay? So, so these are different trials, okay? This is a representing a stimulus here, could be, for example, a picture, okay? And so as you can see, we got some aspects of the signal that tend to be time-locked, so they happen at the same, always at the same time, okay? So if you average them over, you're gonna get a nice, clean um, waveform at the end, okay? But typically, later on, you also have some other oscillatory components that are not phase locked. And okay? so basically, you get this one happens here, this one happens a little earlier, this one a bit later, okay? So when you do that, you get phase counter phase, and in the end, you basically get nothing in the average, okay? So that's one of the big um, issues when you're looking at some of these, um, um, some of these phenomena, okay? So what you can do, um, instead of averaging um, across time, like, like here, okay, trials across time, what you can do, you can actually go into the frequency domain, okay? And uh, what people do nowadays, really, they, they use typically wavelet transforms, so called, okay? Wavelets are this kind of little, that's what I call wavelets, I like these little wavelets, okay? At a particular frequency, and that span a small time window with this kind of tapered uh, profile, okay? So what you can do, uh, you can uh, uh, get your signal here, okay? And you convolve essentially uh, the signal with a, ba a bank of these different wavelets at different frequencies, okay? And what happens in the end is that you get a spectrogram like this one that tells you whether at a particular point in time uh, there is a frequency of a particular, um, a particular frequency, okay? So in this case you have that, uh, for example, at this time there is quite a bit of uh, power at the frequency of this wave, okay? Anyway, that's a way, essentially, of uh, decomposing your, uh, your time signal, right, into, um, into a bunch of, of time frequency, right, uh, information. And uh, you come up with this spectrogram that tells you exactly what uh, frequency content there is at, at each point in time, okay? So again, you can look it up, there is a, a standard interpretation of this transform. But in practice, that means that if you have different trials, like this one, this one, this one, and this one, and uh, um, as you can see again, right, if you average these trials directly over time, you get nothing, right? But if you do uh, the wavelet transform on each trial, you're going to see that there is um, a lot of uh, uh, gamma activity here, yeah, around 40 hertz, about around 250 to 300 milliseconds. This trial, this trial, and this trial. And if you then average these things uh, after doing the wavelet transform, you actually are able to preserve this information. Okay? So you can see in the final uh, plot, right, that there is this uh, burst of gamma, right, 40 hertz approximately, around 300 milliseconds post stimulus, right, even though in each single trial this uh, burst is not precisely time locked. Okay? Great. So that's why we do this kind of analysis. And for example, this is from a classic study in which uh, people were trying to see if, uh, um, trying to look at, you know, the, the binding hypothesis and the role of 40 hertz in binding different parts of the visual scene, right? And as you can see, right, around 300 milliseconds after presenting this kind of uh, uh, kinds of triangle, right, where you can do some grouping here, you get this uh, burst of, of gamma, whereas you don't see it when actually you cannot do this grouping because these three elements are not, you can group, okay? As an example. But anyway, the main point of these few slides here really, just to say that there are other ways of doing analysis other than the ERP way of averaging things um, across time. Okay? You can go into the frequency domain and you can actually measure some uh, oscillations, induced oscillations around that. Okay? Okay. 
Now, I want to spend just a few minutes on, uh, on a different issue, which is, I think, uh, quite important, right? Because many times when people uh, start doing EEG, they, um, you know, they, they see the fMRI stuff and they say, okay, well, how well can I localize the EEG, okay? And uh, they sometimes, you know, you think of EEG as a, as a poor man, as a fMRI machine, right? But it's not, okay? Great. So let me just see basically where, where we are with uh, uh, localizing sources of the signals, okay? Now, there are two components. The first one is uh, what is called the forward solution, okay? Which means that you, um, you go from, um, you have a source inside your head, this is like a dipole, okay? A bunch of neurons are uh, basically active at the same time. And you want to basically see what kind of distribution this guy is going to produce on the scalp, okay? That's called the forward solution, right? It's actually quite simple, this is like a um, simple um, uh, algebra, right? In an algebra, right? And x is basically your uh, vector of scalp potentials, okay? S is the uh, vector of current densities inside the head. And L is a matrix called the transfer matrix. Basically, you have to specify the uh, conductivity of the skull and all the different fish layers that are on top of the brain, okay? Again, I'm not going to go into details, but that's just the general form of this equation, right? And it turns out that this one is actually uh, very simple to do, okay? You can use uh, either a simple uh, spherical model, for example, okay? to do the speculations, where you have to specify the conductivity of the brain, skull, skull, and all that. For example, you can try to fit, you know, a sphere to an MRI, if you want, okay? And the reason to do that is because this is like a very simple model, okay? So you can have actually a single layer, or three layer, or four layer sphere. And the reason why it's simple is that you actually can have an equation, just you can solve it analytically, right, very quickly. You can give it uh, a dipole inside the head, or multiple dipoles, you can uh, easily calculate the distribution on this sphere, okay? The problem is that it's not very accurate, as you can imagine, because uh, it may be okay up here, but down here it's, all, uh, it's not really a good approximation of, of the head, okay? The other thing you can do is that is you, do, you take an MRI of the subject, and you uh, segment all the different tissue types, okay? So you've got your, uh, your skull, your skull, the dura mater, and all the different layers, okay? And you have to also measure the conductivity of these layers, which is not trivial at all. So you have to make some assumptions, okay? You also basically, you can um, basically uh, compute the geometry of, of, the, of the cortex and all that. And of course, you have to measure also where your lectures are exactly. And with this information, you can actually uh, create these more realistic head models, okay? And basically, you can essentially uh, now compute, right, the fact of some distribution of current density inside the head on the scalp distribution that you're measuring, okay? <coughs> the problem is that is uh, obviously computationally complex. It can be, it can take quite a long time to do this, okay, if you have a very precise model with high resolution, right? Of course, the, uh, sorry, I, I, I flipped still, okay, anyway, fine. Uh, of course, it's more accurate in general, right? And so if you can do that, you should do it, all right? So this, here's an example of uh, a super simplified case. If you have a single dipole, okay, so basically a plus or a minus, okay, inside the head, near the cortex, okay, near the, near the, uh, the skull, right? How is it going to look like on the surface? Okay, it's going to look like this one, okay? So this one is tangential. It's going to have a plus or minus. That's what it's going to look like. If you have a, a deep tangential source, or so something deeper into the brain, right? It's going to look actually pretty distributed, and you know, this, you can still see kind of a, a positive side and a negative side, okay? There's going to be much broader, obviously. And same here if you have a radial source, so something that points up, okay? Near the skull, you're going to have something like this. You see most of the positive side. And if it's deeper, you're going to see basically the entire head is basically correct, okay? Let's give an example of this. Now, we got the inverse problem is the one that allows us to localize things, okay? So for the inverse problem, we go from non distribution of the head, okay, what you're measuring, your EEG, to the internal. Um, Correct, okay? Essentially, what's going on in the sources of these effects, right? So, in principle, all you have to do is invert this matrix and basically they're set. In reality, it's really complicated, 
Okay? And it's really complicated for a number of reasons, right? But that's basically the, the general formulation of the problem, right? You want to find the distribution of current densities S that minimizes the difference between, um, basically, uh, the actual versus of the computer stuff distribution, okay? The problem is that this is an impulse problem, so-called, right? So for those of you who know uh, linear algebra and all this kind of stuff, uh, that means that it's unspecified, okay, indeterminate, right? So you there are infinite solutions to this problem, meaning that you can come up with an infinite number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, current densities in here that produce exactly the same scalp distribution. That's a big problem, okay? Well, let's see how people have tried to solve this. You solve it by applying some constraints, okay? So in general, the problem is uh, imposed. So what you want to do is that, okay, let's see what constraints you can apply to the solutions and see if we can come up with one solution, okay? All right, so there are two general categories of methods to do this. One of them is called the, the equivalent current dipole methods, okay? And the main assumption of these methods is that uh, there is only a small number of dipoles inside the head, okay, active at any time, and these dipoles are actually the ones that are producing our scalp distribution, okay? Perhaps the most, the most well-known um, algorithm for that is, is Visa, there's a company that sells basically this software, which costs a lot of money, too much for all of those, right? But basically that allows you to uh, essentially uh, do this kind of uh, inverse um, solution, right, using um, a set of dipoles, okay? So in this case, as you can see, you can assume that there are just a few dipoles here, here, there, you can see them in, on the brain here, okay? And these are the, the main uh, sources of your effects, okay? So what you do, basically, each dipole has six parameters, right? Like this guy here, because you got X, Y, Z, location, you got the two angle, right? And then you got the strength, okay? Six parameters. And typically you have uh, more than one dipole. And so what this uh, computation does is trying to essentially um, find the six parameters for each, for each dipole. So there are lots of parameters floating around, okay? And the way it works is that it tries, it's an iterative method, right? So it tries to, um, to calculate certain positions, it looks at the distribution, and then it tries to uh, tweak a little bit the position, the angle, and see if it get better or not, okay? Until you converge onto some solution, okay? Now, I think this method is, uh, is still used by some people, but I think it's, it's really questionable, okay? Because from what we know from the brain, we know that it's not just a few dipoles, okay? Typically, there's a lot of stuff going on all the time, okay? So I think uh, it's, it's really questionable. Some people still use it probably because they, they still have the software and they have to use it, I guess, right? Also, uh, the problem is that we cannot really uh, know if the solution is accurate or not, okay? All we have is this uh, residual variance number that tells me basically, right, how different the distribution, the calculated distribution is from the actual distribution, right? But we don't know for sure that the dipole combination we have is really the, the only or the correct combination of dipoles. Okay? There's no way. Unless you go inside the brain you know, and, and look at and look at the, what they are. Okay? So that's one major problem of this uh, method, actually, most methods, right? And also the other main problem is that it's really um, you can really tweak a lot. Okay? So basically the way it goes is that the user selects how many dipoles they want to use, right? And also the initial position of these dipoles. Okay? So you can you can see how you can kind of cheat, right? You can basically do the thing until you find something that looks good for your ticket. Okay? So I don't like this method, right? And I'm, I'm not using it. Okay. And then we got the other set of methods which are actually more realistic in terms of what we know about the brain, right? These are called the student source methods, right? And what you do is that you um, essentially divide up the brain, okay, into um, bunch of boxes, okay? If you have too many, it becomes too complicated, but you know, a bunch of boxes, right? Little boxes. And each box is supposed to basically contain, right, one electric dipole. Okay? So you've got many, many of them. And uh, so we assume that the distribution is really across the entire brain, right? The problem is that typically you've got only uh, about, say, 100 electrodes, okay? 100 recordings. And you're trying to estimate sources for thousands and thousands of data points inside the brain, okay? So it's, the problem is that this is an underdetermined problem, 
you've got too many things to fit, given the data you have. And so again, you have to essentially come up with constraints, okay? So one thing you can do is that you can uh, postulate that all the active sources have to be on the corpus, okay? That's one assumption, right? Or you can also say, well, they have to be on the cortex and also be orthogonal to the cortex, like diodes, like neurons are orthogonal to the cortex, right? If you have the neurons. But even if you do that, you find that you have uh, still more than one solution, okay? It's just not enough to, okay? So you have to have additional constraints. One of them is called the minimal norm. Let me just briefly explain what that is, so when you read it, you know what it means. So let's say this is a, a cut through the brain, okay, just a schematic, right? And uh, these are our electrodes, E1 to E6. And this one is one piece of cortex, just uh, one sulcus here, okay? Now, if you, uh, if you assume that the sources are on the cortex, right, um, you're going to basically have a situation in which you may have two sources here, S15 and S16, that are exactly opposite each other, you know, that they cancel out each other, okay? Cancel each other out, okay? Now, because of that, any strength that this guy has can be matched by the same strength of this guy. So you can have you know, a small one, a big one, a super big one, okay? And uh, since you have the situation in many parts of the brain, in reality, you have many cell sites, that's why we have a non-unique solution, because, uh, as I said, you know, this solution is good, but even if you double this strength and this strength, it's still going to be a good solution because uh, these two cancel each other, okay? So one way of solving this non-uniqueness problem, really, is to impose some constraints on, on the amplitude of these uh, vectors, okay? So one way of doing that is to say that we are going to uh, find, basically, the solution that produces both the observed star distribution, right? But also that has the minimum overall source magnitude, okay? So you want to basically keep these guys as small as possible. Everywhere. Okay? That way you're gonna try to basically um, you can actually have a unique solution, okay? And uh, that's what the minimum of constraint does, right? Now a big problem with these uh, constraints is that it's biased towards superficial sources, right? Because to have a deep source you have to have like something that is much bigger, otherwise you're not going to see it, okay? So it's uh, Bias towards small sources that tend to be superficial. Okay, so you're going to miss all the, super, all the depth, the stuff in that. You're going to see it with this constraint. Okay. Now another constraint that has been used really is called the maximum smoothness constraint, and this is the one used in Loretta, if you've heard of that, right? So this one is just another way that you can you can do things. You can say that you want a solution that gives you the observed scalp distribution but also that has the smoothest possible um, set of source magnitudes and things that are very smooth, okay? Now, again, this guy also has a problem because sometimes you have uh, some areas that are active, so if I show you a uh, moving stimulus, you're going to get, you know, area MT, very active, but your buying areas are not active, so you have, uh, you're going to have sharp borders in the brain, and so it's kind of problematic sometimes. But the point is that you have uh, different methods with different constraints, right? None of them is really working in all cases, and so uh, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a problem to feel because you can try different methods and then you're going to pick the one that you like. Okay, so it's a bit of a problem. I'm just going to tell you uh, this because it's good to keep in mind, right? I think that the good thing about these methods, though, is that essentially they are uh, they produce a unique solution and also automatic. So you cannot really cheat if you use a particular if you use a particular constraint, it's going to give you one solution, right? What you can do is you can say, well, I'm going to use another one and see how that works. Okay? But again, this is something to, something to keep in mind when you think about um, localization with EEG. Okay? If you have like a single dipole, it's going to work very well. But in all your experiments, there's going to be probably hundreds of things going on in the brain at the same time. And so uh, you have to really think carefully about, um, about your question. Okay? You will, if you use EEG, you want your main question to have to do with, with, uh, with time, not with space. Okay? Of course, if you have access to other techniques, you know, fMRI and stuff like that, then you can try to combine these things. Okay? 
Okay, one last thing I want to say, just a couple of points about stats, okay? Nothing in detail. Again, we can spend probably a couple of hours talking about the details of this, right? But I just want to say a few things about, um, um, about how to think about stats, about the EG and, uh, and this kind of data sets, right? The main point, the main problem with uh, these data sets, and not just EEG, also fMRI, right? Is that we have um, lots of dimensions. We have thousands and thousands and millions of data points and they're correlated in space and in time, okay? So they're not standard in terms of statistics. They're not like psychological data sets, okay? And basically, all this kind of correlation, we have to take them into account to uh, be able to do proper statistical testing, especially when you um, start exploring your data, okay? Because if you look hard enough, you're always going to find something, right? That's the thing. And the question is that, is that significant or not? Most of the data sets violate uh, most of the parametric tests that you've been using in psychology, like I know this is an event, okay? so we have to do either corrections or we have to use something else. I think one thing that uh, uh, you should keep in mind in that is that it is good to test a priori hypothesis, okay? So I know that Chris Harris said, no, hypothesis are bad, okay? All this testing is bad. Actually, that's one of the things that you should be doing, okay? So if you have uh, essentially knowledge about certain components, certain potentials, about what they happen and when they happen and all that, you actually have to use this information because then you can test specific hypotheses and you don't, you don't have all the problem of alpha correction and all that, okay? One thing you can do in your data set is basically you can use, uh, say, if you're testing 40 subjects, you can use you know, 20 subjects to, um, to explore your data, then you can use the other 20 to actually test a particular hypothesis. You can do the same if you split your trials into all the even, for example, okay, you can have independent data sets, right? And also there is an entire set of non-parametric tests that you can use that actually work pretty well with this kind of data sets, right? But the main thing to keep in mind with statistics, as you uh, probably have been told many times already, is that statistics is really like a proxy for replication, okay? So what you want to know is that your effect is clear that it's going to replicate, okay? So I think that ideally, the best way to actually uh, do things is to just replicate your study, okay? So if you, if you find an effect and you're wondering, oh, well, is this divide really 0.5 or is it distorted or something, the best thing to do is just do the study again, okay? And see if it comes out, right? And this one is what I said about burger, okay? Just don't be obsessed, I think, in general about false positives because actually missing something important is probably more important for science, okay? If you miss something, that, a phenomenon that, you, um, that you're investigating is probably worse than if you actually, by chance, think that some phenomenon that doesn't, that doesn't exist uh, is, is real. Okay, so I think that's, um, that's it, and uh, again, I, I covered just a few things quickly, and um, we'll, uh, we'll go over many of these um, phenomena and ideas in, uh, in the workshop in the fall, right? Specifically with some hands-on um, stuff as well, okay? So, um, what, are there any questions or, or observations? by many of his colleagues, right? But I think that's also uh, part of what I was trying to communicate, you know, to convey that you have to basically look at the data, right? And see, okay, just because that guy thinks his data means that, it doesn't mean that what he found is uh, spurious, right? Okay? So I think that's something to keep in mind, that uh, just because somebody is not considered a serious person by the community, doesn't mean that this person did not find something important. Yeah. And it took 10 years before people in the UK actually were able to, to replicate the effect. I don't, I don't think that's a criticism of him, Yeah, yeah, no. It's more interesting. Yeah, it's my... Yeah, it's my... Yeah, I would like to defend my supervisor, Chris Harris. He didn't say that... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't here, I heard, okay? <laughs> he didn't say that we shouldn't do hypothesis tests. No, no. Actually, we would, we would 
would agree that we should set up a priori hypothesis. Cool. It's just that now hypothesis testing in the way it's practiced in psychology has many flaws and it's related to the inverse problem which you were describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so just for comment actually. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll continue to do the talk. I, I, I have many conversations with Chris himself and his colleague who's agreed. You can just um, make yeah, sure that. that. Yeah. Could I ask a, a crazy, crazy question? No. Um, <laughs> If, um, if psychic abilities existed and you could see them on an EEG, what would it look like? Well, I, actually, no, I, there was actually a famous uh, uh, little science paper um, in the 60s, I think, or 70s, right? Where people, what they did, they put two people in different chambers, right? And they, they were showing, like, you know, there was like a P3 kind of experiment. Okay? So one subject sees, you know, beep, 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 boop, you know? And then they look at the time series of the subject in the other room to see if you could see some, when the person in the first room uh, was seeing like a target, would there be something also in the person in the other room, okay? By virtual collectors and so, okay? It was in science, okay? So I, I haven't read the paper in a long time, and I don't know what, uh, frankly, I don't remember what kind of problems there were, okay? But that's, you know, one way in which you could try to look at this uh, kind of an art if you wanted to, right? What is the author's name? I forgot, but okay. if you, there, was, there was a famous science paper that um, I remember reading, because at some point they thought, hmm, perhaps you could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, if, if you find that, actually, I'd be interested in, uh, in, uh, in knowing the, the name because I forgot. Entire career, seeing okay, if I tweak this, if I that, does it get a bit better or not, right? Yeah. But for us, I think it's important as um, we're going to be mostly users of the technique, right? It's good to, to keep in mind this, that there are these difficulties. Also, when you read the papers and you see somebody who tells you, I did some localization and I found exactly this spot, you know, well, okay, you have to wonder, okay, what did it do really? And, you know, if you, find, if you use another algorithm, did you get the same thing or not, okay? So there are all these um, yeah. complications. Oh, thanks, that was a great introduction, and I think now that everybody's heard that, uh, if you've got ideas for things you would like to be able to do in the workshop, it would be good to speak with Giorgio yeah. or email or whoever and yeah. try to put together a workshop that has all the components that you would like to investigate. So, uh, and that will be September, October time. Yeah, yeah perfect.